What's up, mortgage coach community? I can't remember the last time I did an interview like this on a Saturday afternoon, but uh, it's good to be with Rob Crispin. What's up, Rob? Nothing. <laughs> Come on. That's you, and I, you and I just uh, uh, simultaneously apart watched the, the, the new blockbuster movie, which was thrilling Tom Cruise love fest. Yeah, we just, we didn't watch it together. I'm in San Diego, he's in Tahoe, but we both uh, pretty much same time watched Top Gun. It was amazing. But, uh, you know, this, this call, Rob, is about a research project that I'm doing and I'm, an article I wanna write. And I wanted it to be well-researched, not just my opinion, but the opinion of people that have been in the business for a long time. I don't think everyone I've interviewed, I think, has been in the business for over 30 years, 20 years. Uh, CEOs, uh, speakers, you, you've got the most well-read uh, newsletter uh, media platform in the mortgage industry. So I wanted to get your answers to these questions. Uh, so Rob, just if there is a new loan officer watching this and they don't know you, if you could just give a minute on who you are for any new loan officers that are tuning into this. I'm a tired old silverback capital markets dude who's been in the business since the mid eighties doing capital markets. If, if you don't subscribe to my commentary, that's fine. If you do, uh, that's good too. But if you'd like to, you can sign up at www.robchrisman.com. Takes about 60 seconds to sign up. And it's just a free flowing daily commentary, but my background is capital markets. So that's kind of where my focus is as opposed to being an originator. I've never been an originator. So I'm fascinated with that side of the business. Good. Well, if anyone who's watching this does not get that newsletter, uh, you're crazy. It's requirement for anyone in the mortgage business, whether you're in the C-suite or you're a loan officer. So, so Rob, I've never seen a year like this. I've been doing this since 87. And usually when I talk about how long I've been in the business, I say the first month I closed the loan was in August of 87 and rates were 10.26 at a little over two points. And I thought I missed it. You know, I thought like, and you know, all these guys before me had killed it and rates had come down so fast. I thought I missed it, but this is an interesting market. And in the fact that rates have gone up over 2% in two months, but there's also some really positive data points in the market. So first, from your perspective, what are two or three of the most impactful data points that one are difficult and let's not call out interest rates because that's so obvious to everyone. And then also a data point that creates some opportunities in the market. What comes to mind? Well, I think the big concern is, first of all, so much of what we, what we deal with is interest rate driven, but we have done a magnificent job of putting millions of borrowers in two and three quarter or 3% loans. And so the, the refi burnout, even if rates had stayed down there, the refi burnout that we saw coming toward us was, was evident. We all knew at some point rates were going to go up, the economy would change, no matter who is in charge of the administration or who's in charge of the Federal Reserve, they can't really, you know, do away with the business cycles. So, you know, boom or bust, recession or expansion, high rates, low rates, they, they tend to go in cycles. And so the people in our industry who have been around a long time saw all of these great mortgages that were being given to borrowers across the nation, millions of borrowers were, were seeing some great rates and thinking, all right, at some point we're gonna be done with this. And as I said, even when rates stayed the same, even if rates were to stay the same, these borrowers would not be coming back in for a, a rate and term refi. So, which leads to, I'll start with a big benefit and that is the, the cash out refi market, which is, is evident to everybody. There's a tremendous amount of equity that's out there and the borrowers who do have, say, a two and three quarters or 3% loan, home loan, I'll tell you, their credit card debt or their car debt or other debt they may have is probably not a two and three quarters or 3%. So I am hearing from top originators who are seeing cash out refis coming into the market <clears throat> and to some extent taking the place of rate and term refis. 
So that's one thing that I'm seeing out there. The second thing I'm seeing out there are companies who are expanding their product set. You know, that we're not we're not seeing Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA loans fall from the sky. We're just not loan officers and lenders aren't holding out their hands, gathering this mana from heaven. They are having to go out and hunt for loans. And every deal now is harder than it was six months or a year or even two years ago. So lenders and originators really are having to, to work for leads work for loans and once they have a lead or a loan you know there's there's a lot of hair on some of these deals and so what lenders are doing is offering other programs to their originators that may not have been evident a year or two ago so we're seeing an increase in down payment assistance programs we're seeing an increase in housing finance authority programs we're seeing an increase in HELOCs and seconds and USDA, whatever it might be that uh, is, is probably in the playbook for lenders is being dusted off. And then the big, big question mark or big, big topic of conversation is the non-QM channel. You know, are borrowers, especially self-employed borrowers, can we take advantage of some of these non-QM programs that are out there. And I'm not talking about stated, stated and MENA loans and so forth that we all saw 13 years ago or so, 14, 15 years ago. But these are borrowers who arguably should be extended credit. And so a lot of lenders out there are taking another look at non-QM. You know, the non-QM industry has been around for several years now. And it seems like every year they say, oh, we're going to represent a sizable portion of of lending the last couple of years, they haven't had time really from an originator perspective to deal with non-QM. And now the pipelines have dropped, applications have dropped, the borrowers have gotten a little bit harder in terms of the, the, the hair on the deal. And so non-QM is being specifically brought out by many lenders to say, okay, what kind of offerings are out there? How can, how can these offerings help our borrowers, help my borrower? and so forth. So I'm seeing those things go on out there. And then lastly, uh, for better or for worse, I'm seeing companies really stress efficiency and stress costs. When volume was flooding the, flooding the, the portals and companies were having to change their pricing you know, to make it less, uh, less aggressive, more conservative, just to shut off that fire hose of volume because these companies didn't have the op staff and then as 2021 went on and as we entered 2022, suddenly the industry basically caught up operationally with the volume that was out there. And now, however, it's flipped to where companies are having to improve efficiency and having to streamline costs. And unfortunately, that means a lot of layoffs. But I think in the long run, it'll make these companies healthier to lower their cost structure. Unfortunately, the, the statistics from the MBA continue to show the cost per loan going up over $10,000 now to produce a loan. And so when that starts to come down, I think will be a huge advantage to lenders out there. Right now, companies are having a little bit of trouble cutting costs ahead of the volume that we're seeing. So at some point, a lot of lenders will right size their ships as it were, and I think be in a better position to move forward. Kind of like trimming, trimming a tree or a bush, you know, it, it hurts to do initially, but then they grow back healthier. Love, thank you for that. So uh, what's up, Dan Keller and um, Leonard Cullip? If you guys have any questions for Rob, we're gonna go for about another 10. So feel free to throw them in comments. I'll bring any questions that come in into the conversation. So since you're a CAPS guy and you're, you know, talking to all lenders in that, I've. I've, I've, I've interviewed CEOs of companies, I've interviewed consultants, and I've interviewed top producing $100 million producers, and, and they're calling out trends of a lot more arms, although calling out that the, you know, the banks and the credit unions, you know, have better arms than, you know, um, distributed retail, I'm, I'm hearing of buy downs, permanent buy downs, where, 
people are paying you know, more than two points to buy down a rate to help with affordability. Uh, do you see any rapid, you know, change in, you know, more arm options, you know, more competitive arm options, uh, buy downs, any, any product trends that you think we should be on the lookout for? So arms are an easy topic to talk about, and I didn't bring them up in my previous diatribe, because the, the pricing has not filtered down from the capital markets into the primary markets. The, the arm market is still very much a portfolio lender product, credit unions, banks. The investors out there, the traditional mortgage-backed security investors, really don't know quite where to price arms with the SOFR index or other indices besides LIBOR. But, but in addition to that, rates move so much through March and April, and they've quieted down in May to some extent. But the, the speed at which rates went up caught not only ARM investors by surprise, but also fixed rate at MBS, traditional MBS investors by surprise. So on the ARM side, when you look at the traditional owners of adjustable rate mortgage-backed securities, the field is, is more narrow than just the traditional insurance companies and pension fund. And those insurance or those companies have to match their liabilities with ARM assets. And they don't want to pay 103 or 104 or a premium 102 for something that, gosh, if we do get into a recession and rates drop and suddenly these ARM loans you know, are called by their loan officers, or I should say the ARM borrowers are called by loan officers say, hey, I know we gave you this loan six months ago, rates have dropped, I think you should lock in a 30-year fixed rate loan. They don't want to be in the position of seeing all these early payoffs uh, before the, you know, the three-year or five-year or seven-year adjustment period is even close to being finished. And so you have ARM investors who are very hesitant about pricing anything above par because when the loan pays off, in the, if the loan pays off, they're going to get par and it's going to be a two-point loss or a three-point loss. And so they're very hesitant about following the market up there. And so I didn't mention ARMS because the pricing just isn't there yet from an independent mortgage banker's perspective. It's, it's obviously there from a portfolio lender, you know, Big Bank, a Wells Fargo, and so forth. But the, the typical independent mortgage banker, it's not there yet. So people are talking about adjustable rate mortgages. On top of that, you have kind of a flat yield curve. And I'm not going to get into the mechanics of a yield curve, but if the mechanics... I mean, if the yield curve is very steep, you'd see a big difference between a three-year or five-year adjustable rate mortgage and say a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. That big difference isn't there. And so that you know half a percent or 1% that might exist in the marketplace doesn't correspond to a lot of arm business for independent mortgage banks. So they kind of sit on the sidelines and watch the, the credit unions and banks get the lion's share of that production, which obviously infuriates a lot of loan officers, but the right now the credit unions and the banks really have the upper hand in terms of that product line. Okay, so I'm gonna do two more questions and I'm gonna move into the opportunity zone. And uh, you know, one thing that's always surprised me, you know, um, serving the mortgage space as long as I have, is that loan officers and lenders put most of their time and money into chasing new relationships, you know, whether that's, a new realtor relationship or that's new customers. And I always feel like the ratio of how much money they put into their past clients and into their database, is it, is it on par with the opportunity? And I also don't think they really measure just how many loans they lose. You know, the, I, I, there's a, isn't there a metric called the constant prepayment rate that really measures, you know, the, that, uh, do you mind one explaining what that is? Cause I don't think enough people know about it. And then also, if you don't mind sharing, maybe you know, maybe you don't know, or maybe you have a guess as to what it is right now. I have no idea what it is now. The, the, constant, the constant prepayment rate, the CPR, is a, is a measure, kind of a scientific measure of 
of the loans that are prepaying. And so let's take a step back, Dave. If you, if I tell you, Dave, I'm going to give you ten dollars a month. Um, what's that? What's that ten dollars a month worth to you? The first question you're going to ask is, are you going to give it to me for a month, or are you going to give it to me for thirty years? And if I say well, a month, it's worth you know ten bucks to you. If I say thirty years, out comes the calculator. And you take, okay, $10 a month times 30 years, that's, you know, whatever, and then discount it back. You know, you, you come up with a value of that $10 a month. The same thing works with servicing. When you extend credit to a borrower and they start making their payments, let's say they're paying $1,500 or $2,000 a month, and the investor in that mortgage-backed security receives let's say they receive $1,900 a month and the servicer keeps $10 a month, that $1,900 has value to that, to that investor. And so they are basing part of the value of that mortgage-backed security on that receiving that $1,900. When prepayments go up, meaning typically rates are coming down, then that is a problem because that $1,900 that that servicer was counting on can, can vanish. And the conversely, the value of servicing goes up when rates go up, because if you have a 3% loan and you're making those payments and that holder of that asset is receiving $1,900 a month, the odds of receiving that $1,900 a month go go up because they're they probably won't prepay and then the value of the servicing receiving that ten dollars a month goes up as, as well so the value of servicing goes up so really the uh you you counteract that versus the fact that gee back then we were in a three percent world and now we're in a five and a half percent world the value of the actual bond goes down but the value of the servicing goes up. And one way to measure that is the prepayment rate. And, and the, the fact is, it's, it's very interesting. It's, it's not a guess, it's a, it's a way of determining cash flows of, of servicing. And I think that, you know, there's a certain, I'm not gonna say there's guesswork, or, but there is certainly some forecasting that is involved, but the CPR is a method that servicers use to value servicing and come up with what is this income stream worth based on the prepayment models and the prepayment behavior that we're seeing now. So one of the things we're thinking about at Sales Boomerang because we have over 270 lenders, you know, where we have, we're helping them manage their database so we can provide borrower intelligence and trigger alerts. And, and even in our sales process, we do a loss loan report, you know, like, hey, let's take your data see how many loans you lose. And so we were thinking about doing a loss loan index for the industry. But are you aware of any indexes? Well, where... you mean in terms of the loans that may, the, that a borrower... They, they changed lenders. They paid off their loan and they went, like if you had past clients in your database and they just did a loan with someone else and not you, it's a loss loan. Well, you... isn't that, wouldn't that be a... Uh, gee, I, I, I did a loan for that bar two years ago, and now they're pulling credit. No, that, no. Well, that's called a credit inquiry, you know, which we have that. But I'm talking about like literally, you know, let's say you got, I'm just going to use a thousand loans in your database and are, you know, past customers you've done a loan for and they'll run a report and see if they still have a loan at the same place or if they got a new loan and they didn't use you. So, you know, I have this thesis that the biggest cost of mortgage companies is not, is you know, it's it's lost loans. You know, they take an app and they could have done it, but the loan officer didn't do it, so they lost a loan. They took an app, they didn't convert it, so they lost a loan. Or they did a loan for someone and they did the next loan with someone else. Like if you add all up those lost loans in those three tiers, it's, you know, I make the case that it's the biggest problem you have as a lender and loan officer, and there should be more time, attention, tech, obsession over not losing loans are you aware of any indexes or no not not really the um 
and I'm not going to argue with you. I think I think you have your finger on the pulse of the originators per se more than I do. I'm just sitting here thinking about why a an originator. There, there's there's certainly been studies done on how many loans the quote average person obtains during their lifetime and how many times they move and how many times they do this, that, and the other thing. And I would argue that the it's up to the originator really to make a client for life. And that's probably an overused top or overused statement, but you know, you want to be, you want to be in theory on, the lender on forever. That, the lender on, forever. On, yeah, on that on that borrower's mind. And I'll tell you that when you ask the typical person, I'm, I'm throwing out these generalizations. So, but anyway, when you when you ask the average person waiting in line behind you in Dunkin' Donuts, uh, do you have a mortgage? Yeah, I think I think yeah, we've got a mortgage. What's your interest rate? You know, I don't know. My my wife handles that. They won't know their interest rate. But if you say, do you remember who you got your loan through? Yeah, I got it through this guy, Dave Savage. He's, you know, about his office is about a mile away. Oh, really? What's the name of the company? I don't remember the name of the company. Uh, but I know, I think my wife said, you know, last month, my, my loan was sold to PHH and we're sending our payments there. That, that's, that's the usual discussion topic that I've heard. And they may not remember who Dave Savage worked for, but they remember the way you treated them and the way you made them feel. And they're either going to come back to you or they're not. And so you can scientifically say, well, gee, when, when Rob Chrisman goes to this thing about refinancing or whatever it might be, is Dave on the top of my mind? I would like to say, yeah, he did a, he did a great job for us. I'm going to call him up and say, hey, we've got, you know, we just bought a sprinter and we're paying 15% on, you know, 80,000, whatever, whatever it is. Or I'm going to think, you know, Death Dave, he didn't do such a good job. And, and my neighbor, you know, Francine over there, she really liked the, the, the job that Tom at Wells Fargo did for her. So I'm going to call Francine and get Tom's, you know, number. I, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things that go through borrowers' minds. And so even I, I, to throw the burden back on the loan officer, if, if I am looking elsewhere, even if I were to get a call from Dave Savage, hey, Rob, uh, you know, how's it going? Uh, you know, blah, 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 whatever the sales pitch is, I might be like, hey, Dave, everything's good. Hey, you know what? My, my, I'm making some pasta. The water's boiling over. I got to jump, but let's stay in touch. It's up to the originator not to have that kind of discussion with the bar. So. I couldn't agree more on any loan officer list of this. You know, that's why doing mortgage reviews are important. You know, we advocate that in the mortgage coach community and why we have a lot of CRMs that will actually automate a total cost analysis every month or every quarter. So, so last question, uh, you know, when I'm interviewing a lot of loan officers and leaders, you know, there's this expectation that, you know, rates might go up a little more in the short run, but that, you know, once a recession is called out, and by the end of the year, they, they could be coming down. And by first quarter, they could be even lower. If, if I'm not gonna ask you to be the crystal ball, but what are your thoughts on, you know, road rates in the fours by the end of the year, rates in the threes next year? What's your opinion on that? I'm gonna say, what if rates go down a percent? Who, who are you going to refinance you're, you're not once again going to get you know rate and term refis from bars in the twos and threes so right. you're, you're you're those people are staying there you're going to get cash out refis which may be happening now anyway because credit card debt they are. Our debt happening. Happening is, is higher already are you going to be refinancing this diminished pool of borrowers who are getting loans in the mid fives. Maybe, maybe those borrowers won't qualify because they just lost their job in a recession. That said, Dave, I will, I, I just don't, I've been saying this for months when the, when the, when the whole recession topic started to come up, 
I personally don't see recession in the near future. If you look closely at the smartest guys and gals in the rooms, uh, in the room, their predictions, they're talking about recessions in 2023, a recession in 2023 or 2024. You know what? I don't know what I'm going to be doing for lunch tomorrow, much less <laughs> trying to predict a recession two years out. And you know what? Two years out, am I going to be able to go back to Susie, Susie Forecaster or you know Gloria Goldman Sachs and say, hey, back in May or June of 2022, you were predicting a recession in 2023. It didn't happen. Well, they'll have a reason why it didn't happen. Oh, I know. I know. But but the thing is, when I once again, I know Americans are eating through a certain portion of their savings. The savings rate has come back down. And if you're especially a service worker and you're paying six dollars for a gallon of gas, you're using up a lot more of your paycheck for that rather than saving money for a house or for a vacation. I realize that that's going to catch up with us. But right now I'm continuing to see restaurants that are jam packed, airport parking lots that are jam packed, flights that are shoulder to shoulder. I, I see an economy that's still doing very, very well. So if we're getting into a recession and, you know, we're going to get into a recession at some point, you know, at some point the business yeah, cycle, where it, where it goes. at some cycle. point it's going to happen. Great. But I'm not going to base my business model now on rates coming back down in 2023 or 2024. I'm going to try to take the loan programs that my company has and do the best that I can helping my borrowers now rather than rather than trying to predict interest rates or listening to some other some other prediction of interest rates because that's not going to feed my family in June. I've got to act now and and do what I can to help my borrowers now and fine if we get into a recession I'll deal with it then and recessions are very complicated animals. It's just not two quarters of, of negative GDP and it's not just because the inverted because the yield curve is inverted. It's, it's relatively complicated what constitutes a recession, but you know I'll, I'll deal with it then. I'll, and I'll still be helping my borrowers then in a recession. Well, uh, very pragmatic, practical advice, and you know we always talk about you know my theory is manage families' mortgages, and and you, you never. My grandpa used to always say you never lose money taking a profit, which is basically you know play the ball where it's at. Uh, get people into loans if that's what they want right now. So, hey, Rob, I really appreciate you taking time on a Saturday. Uh, you gave a lot of ideas and some confidence around other ideas that would be in the article, and I appreciate you, brother. So, so Dave, yeah, um, do you want to put in a pitch for you know mortgage coach or anything, or talk about what you're doing, sales boomerang? Hey, well, this is my channel, so I do that all the time. But, oh, all right, then never yeah. mind. Hell with it. Yeah. Well, no, I appreciate that, and and. Although I do want to, now that you, you, you teed me up because I am a sales guy and I do want to make sure you know something that, uh, you know, Rob Crispin knows something about mortgage coach and sales boomerang. Uh, and this is something that kind of blows my mind. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. Break out the PowerPoint. Dave, on, it is man. Saturday afternoon. Dave, don't do this to me. You know what? I, I got to go clean out Myrtle's Bob, litter box. Bob, it's gonna I, be I, like, I got a litter box to clean out. It'll be 60 seconds. But and this is, I want your, really tell me why the industry hasn't caught up to the Zillows and the Rockets when it comes to data, you know, like, and that, that's it, just those two slides, but any idea why the industry hasn't, you know, invested more in data, in big data, and maybe you don't even know, uh, but it's a myth to me. It's, 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 it is a mystery to me too. And, and Dave, I, I have to tell you, you're, one of, you're very, very patient. Every time I see you, just for the, the audience, for years now, Dave would say, Rob, let me show this to you on my phone, the ability that we have. And I'd get out my flip phone and try to fumble through. And Dave would be sitting there shaking his head. Nice guy, Dave. He but you know his password. Little... He didn't even know his password, everybody. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like, uh, so... Uh, but I, I'm not going to sit here and defend lenders. I would say that sometimes lenders are so focused on doing what they're doing rather than uh, uh, putting out resources towards, uh, you know, improving their 
efficiency and improving their technology. And then as things die down like they have now, they're playing a little bit behind the eight ball. But that said, I was, and I, and I was telling a group in, um, in Orange County this earlier, uh, recently, I should say, you know, the, the push button get mortgage ad that we all saw on the Super Bowl, I would say that many, many lenders had that same technology. They didn't have the marketing budget to put an ad on the Super Bowl. And so, and what that did for the lenders who did not have that technology was set a bar that lenders had to say, all right, what, what, does, what, do, what does Rocket slash Quicken have that we don't have? And let's figure it out. If they didn't do that, uh, I'd say they're not, not in good shape right now. Agreed. All right, Rob. Well, hey, thank you, brother. I look forward to seeing you out at an event. Appreciate your time. Thanks for everything you do for our industry. This is a wrap.